Okay, hi everybody, and I uh, hope everyone's getting uh, very excited about the wonderful holiday of Purim that's coming up. Uh, but the Shabbat before Purim, we know that we have a special Torah reading in addition to the normal Parsha of the week. And that is the Torah reading that commemorates Amalek. Amalek was the very first nation that attacked us when we left Mitzrayim. Uh, and uh, they acted without provocation, without cause. It was simply a hatred. Uh, for the Jewish people and a hatred for uh, what Torah represents and we are to remember uh, their hatred uh, forever and ever and eradicate them. Actually there's a mitzvah if you knew that somebody was an Amaleki even today you would pull out your gun and shoot but uh, the Rambam tells us we cannot identify Amalekites today. Uh, the reason why we do this the Shabbat before Purim is because according to our tradition Haman himself was a descendant, he's called Haman the Agagi, that means Haman from Agag, and Agag is described in the book of Shmuel as the king of Amalek, that Shaul was supposed to eradicate, Shaul had mercy on him, uh, Shmuel wound up killing him, but in the brief time between Shaul capturing him and Shmuel killing him, Agag was able to impregnate a woman, and that woman was the ancestor of Haman, and from here the Gemara learns out a very important observation. He who has compassion on the cruel will eventually be cruel for those who deserve compassion. Because it was the misplaced Rachmanut, the misplaced compassion that Shaul HaMelech had for Agag that resulted in Haman who almost destroyed the Jewish people. So one has to be very careful. One thinks getting rid of Amalek is cruel. In point of fact, ultimately it creates benefit, not just for the Jewish people, but benefit uh, for the world uh, as well. In fact, uh, Chazal understands that the whole story of Purim, the whole story of Mordechai and Esther, is to kind of fix up the mistake that Shaul HaMelech made. Because Shaul is from the tribe of Binyamin, and he did not carry out his mitzvah to eradicate Amalek. He spared the king. Sha Mordechai and Esther are descendants of Shaul, so, and Haman is a descendant of Agag. So essentially, Mordechai and Esther are Mesaken. They rectify the failing of Shaul vis-a-vis Amalek. So Shaul vis-a-vis Agag was rectified by Mordechai and Esther orchestrating the downfall of Haman and the destruction of of Amalek. It's kind of a tikkun. In the cosmic scheme of things, what the future generations do, rectify, can rectify potentially, the sins of the, of the past. So that is why Chazal were metaken, that although technically one should remember Amalek every single day of the year, but particularly before Purim, we think about Amalek because that is the mapala, that is the downfall of Haman. But here I just want to uh, point out a very interesting thought. Uh, Amalek actually attacked us twice in the Chumash. The first time was right after we left Mitzrayim, and they were the very first nation that attacked us in the oasis uh, called Rafidim, which we talked about, I think, a while ago. The second time they attacked us is not really that explicit in the Torah, but it was al almost 40 years later when Aaron HaKohen died. Aaron died before Moshe. And when Aaron died, the clouds of glory that protected us, which were in the merit of Aaron, those clouds of glory dispersed, so we were vulnerable. So the Torah records that a Canaanite king attacked us. But Rashi brings a Medrash. They were actually Amalekites that attacked us, but they disguised themselves as Canaanites because they knew that if Moshe were to pray, if Moshe were to know they were Amalekites, and Moshe would pray to Hashem, uh, destroy the Amalekites, they would be defeated. So they dressed up like Canaanites, thinking that Moshe would therefore pray, Hashem, defeat the Canaanites. But since, they're, um, since they really are Amalekites, they would be safe. Moshe suspected <laughs> that perhaps there was some impersonation here, although he didn't know. And that's why he prayed to Hashem, 
Hashem deliver this nation, whoever they are, into our hands. He didn't mention Canaanites. He didn't mention Amalekites. But according to rabbinic tradition, therefore, even though the Torah describes them as Canaanites, they in fact are Amalekites. That's very important. So that's the second time they attacked us in the desert. The Vilna Gaon points out that the reason that made us vulnerable differs between the two occasions. There is a fundamental idea, and for those who, who heard my show this morning, uh, forgive me for repeating a little bit of it. And that is, there is a notion that we are vulnerable to the Amalekites outside of us only when there is something within us that is a spiritual rot akin to Amalek. And therefore, the concept of eradicating Amalek is not only referring to the Amalek out there, but it also refers to the Amalek in here. Because the Amalek in here makes us vulnerable to the Amalek out there. And therefore, when the Torah says, thou shalt eradicate Amalek, it does have an external referent, to be sure, but it also has an internal referent. The example that I, that I gave this morning was uh, those, um, those horror movies where uh, your, your, your nightmares uh, manifest themselves in monsters that are outside of you, that your dreams turn into the realities. In a sense, that's actually what happens. We create a Malik by the imperfections within our character. So what specifically would be the root of a Malik? So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, pass me touch, yeah, uh, pass me touch, please. Yeah, thank you. Oh, don't worry, I, I don't think uh, I have the coronavirus. So. <laughs> Just a dust allergy, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, so the thing is that let's look at the first time Amalek attacked us, then let's look at the second time, because you'll see a difference. The first time Amalek attacked us in the oasis that is called Rafidim. That's the name of a place. But Chazal also say that Rafidim is an acronym, it's a contraction of two words. Rafu Yadayim Minatorah. Their hands held the tongue to the Torah very loosely. That's an idiomatic expression that refers to complacency, lack of interest. The certain attitude that even if you're doing the Torah and the mitzvahs, you do it without excitement, you do it without passion, you do it without geschmack. You just go through the motions. Amalek has koach over us when we have the attitude that is called Rafidim. And the reason that's so is because according to many descriptions in Chazal, the mental image we have of Amalek is a little different than we normally think. Uh, when we picture Amalek, we think of the axe murderer, the one who, like the Nazis, people who act with total hatred passionate hatred to destroy us. Facts have been pointed out very, very often that uh, Nazism was essentially, in a perverse way, was essentially a religious doctrine that had all sorts of rituals that made no rational sense. I mean, for the German war effort to, to devote German resources to killing helpless Jews in concentration camps was an absolutely absurd, irrational decision. I mean, the Nazis could have used those resources in fighting the Allies. But they looked at it, I mean, I hate to even use the word, they looked at it like a mitzvah, religious fervor, mesiras nefesh. You have to give up, you know, your life in order to do the great mitzvah, God forbid, of killing Jews. So we tend to look at Amalek as that type of radical evil. And that's one picture of Amalek. Radical evil for no reason, just <coughs> evil. But interestingly enough, there's another view of Amalek that emerges from some Midrashim. That Amalek is not the axe murderer who believes in his cause, but Amalek is the cynic who doesn't believe in anything. Think about the lawyer that is the hired hand. He'll represent anybody who pays the bill. Think of the academic who talks about moral relativism. You have your view, I have my view, right? In some college campuses, you'll hear some discussion about, well, 
How do you know the Holocaust was wrong? From the German perspective, you know, they had legitimate reasons. In other words, Amalek could be seen not as the personification of violent, unbridled evil, but the cynical idea that nothing matters. There is no absolute truth. There is no absolute values. That everything is a matter of Tam Bereach, so to speak. Everything is a matter of Tam Bereach, Ein Litzbakeach, right? You don't fight over uh, subjective things. Now that is what the attitude of Rafidim represents. Rafidim means I go through the motions, but I live a life without passion, without feeling, without commitment. This is a fairly serious problem, by the way, uh, within the religious world. Because even a person who is actually very, very observant, a person who davens three times a day, a person who wears tefillin, a person who keeps kosher, a person who keeps Shabbos, someone who is an absolutely an Orthodox Jew, as we would define it, sometimes it may be very dead inside. A lack of feeling. I, I call them the living dead. These are not just kids at risk. These are adults at risk. Now, maybe they're not at risk. It depends how you define it. They may be not at risk to leave mitzvot, although maybe they are. I'm aware of more than one case of people who were literally very religious for their whole lives and in their 30s or 40s just left it. But most of the time, they're not going to leave it simply because it's convenient and comfortable to live in that community. This is your community. This is where your kids go to school. But inside, they're dead. There is no passion. There is no geschmack. Nothing is nourishing their souls. It's like a tree that still has its leaves and still has its fruits. Because even after the tree dies, it'll take a while till that stuff spoils. So the leaves and the fruits still look good. But inside is a deadness. So this is a serious issue. The issue of refidim in which you just go through the motions. And that is so serious that that is said to be the root of Amalek. So the first time Amalek attacked us is because of the attitude of Rafidim that was within our heart. When we have that complacency, lack of passion. That's one of the reasons why Rav Moshe Feinstein uh, used to say that the old Yiddish saying, Tzeshver Tzeshayna Yid, it's so hard to be a Jew. He felt that destroyed a whole generation of Jews growing up in the 20s, 30s. Most of the children of Orthodox immigrants totally left the Yiddish guy. They either intermarried, they certainly did not keep mitzvahs. And obviously, you know, it's oversimplistic to say there's a single reason. In fact, if there's any, any reason in particular, it's the, it was the absence of yeshivos and day schools was probably the main reason. But Rav Moshe Feinstein said, that the attitude that when parents would come home after a 12 hour day in the sweatshop and if they were Shomer Shabbos and they didn't go to work on Saturday they would have to find a new job on Monday and it was hard to be a Jew <laughs> you, can't, you can't take that away from it it was very hard to be a Jew but to communicate that attitude to our children how hard it is so the children come to a land of freedom they come to the United States where they could be anything they want to be they don't have to be a religious Jew if they don't want to be. And they can go to universities and they can become lawyers and doctors and accountants. It was literally an intoxication of freedom. Being drunk with freedom. But what drove them away from Yiddishkeit? Because they saw Yiddishkeit as oppressive. They didn't see it as joyous. They didn't see it as uplifting. They didn't see it as transformative in a positive way. Rafidim, that lack of passion, drives people away. In fact, even the phenomenon of kids at risk, which is a major, major issue, both in the United States, in Israel, and I imagine every other country where there are Jewish uh, kids, in which so many, I don't want to say so many, but, but I mean, you know, it, it, it is a minority, but, but it's a large number. Uh, so many teenagers who come from Orthodox homes kind of leave it. They leave it. Sometimes they eventually come back. Those are the happy endings. Sometimes they don't come back. 
And once again, it's a complicated phenomenon, and God forbid, I, I don't want to blame parents uh, for it. Sometimes you can have the absolutely best, best parents, and things happen. After all, God gave us free will, and people make choices, and the choices are sometimes not good ones. But at least some of the issues are that when people absorb from their parents, even subliminally, subconsciously, that Judaism is oppressive, or, or, even if it's not oppressive, that the parents themselves don't have a passion, or a geschmack, then it's not going to turn them on. You know, the old story, when parents uh, say, uh, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the parent is telling the kid, do this, do this, learn this, and the parent himself is, or herself is not connected to that. That's not going to work. The kid sees through that. In fact, it's very scary. <laughs> it's scary how well children know us. <laughs> they, they, see, uh, they can kind of see exactly what is going through our minds in all of these, all of these scenarios. So again, to, so, 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 so to go back to the main point, the first time Amalek attacked us was because we had the attitude of refidim. Co either complacency, lack of interest, lack of passion, even resentment. And that's an Amalek within us that takes us away from Hashem and that makes us vulnerable to the Amalek outside. In fact, this is very controversial and I, I don't want to get in trouble, uh, but you know, you, many of you heard of a very, very great rabbi, Rabbi Victor Miller, who uh, died a few years ago. He was uh, well into his 90s and he, he was teaching Torah for 70 years. It was a, a, a huge amount of time. And uh, he wrote many books. Very, very good books. Interesting books. Uh, actually, in some ways, there are almost two Rabbi Millers. There's the Rabbi Miller that's warm and fuzzy and kind and encouraging. But Rabbi Miller also had a certain fire and brimstone style at certain points. So it's almost as if you're dealing with uh, uh, two people. Because he could sometimes be very, very tough. And when he died, he left a manuscript uh, with the instruction that it be published after his death. <laughs> and that is uh, his attempt to explain the Holocaust. And it's a very, very controversial book, and I, I'm not at all suggesting that I even endorse it. But his point was that Nazi Germany was the closest thing to Amalek that we could possibly imagine. A virulent hatred with really no provocation and actually against the German national interest. <laughs> I mean, the Jews were uh, so prominent in, in every aspect of German society. Music, philosophy, science, literature. They were the cream of the crop. It certainly did not benefit Germany to destroy Jews. So Nazi Germany, we could say, is the closest to Amalek uh, that, that we could really identify. But Rabbi Miller pointed out that we for sometimes forget that in the decades, uh, towards the end of the 19th century and the early decades of the 20th century, uh, and after World War I, between the wars, there was literally a hemorrhaging. You know, we look at European Jewry and we tend to always think of them as the good old ages, the good old age where everybody was from, everybody was religious, everybody uh, learned Torah, everybody knew Shas, but we don't realize that in those decades there was a hemorrhaging of youth. Youth were leaving Yiddishkeit in droves. They were attracted to socialism, to secular Zionism, to communism, uh, to the so-called enlightenment, which emphasized Jewish culture, separated from Torah. And Rabbi Miller's point was that the Holocaust was kind of God's way of showing us what happens when we leave the Torah. Again, he connected it to the Tochacha. I don't mean to endorse that thesis totally, because obviously even Rabbi Miller did not mean particular victims were necessarily guilty. Obviously that makes no sense because some of the particular victims were the holiest and most righteous. So he's not, he's obviously, even Rabbi Miller does not intend to draw a one-to-one -one comparison, but he's describing a phenomenon that happens in Jewish history, which indeed is documented in the Torah. Uh, the only reason I'm bringing this up because it is a controversial work and I understand that it might actually hurt uh, a lot of people and uh, they'll, they'll vociferously protest it, so I'm not here to defend or, uh, or criticize 
uh, the book. But I just want to point out that if we say that we are vulnerable to Amalek because of the attitude of Rafu Yedeim, because we look at the Torah without passion, without excitement, without commitment, then indeed we can see that in the decades before the Holocaust there was a large-scale Rafu Yedeim in the Torah. Many, I just finished a, a series at Rabbi Wein Shul about the Piazetzna Rebbe, who was the last Hasidic Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, he brilliantly, before the war, people know him because of what he wrote uh, during the Holocaust itself, but the truth of the matter is, even before the Holocaust, he was a master educator. He identified exactly what was happening to teenagers, and he developed very detailed and precise spiritual educational plans, which involved uh, inculcating passion and excitement and spirituality in Chinuch, and he understood that simply learning texts over and over again uh, does not necessarily is not necessarily enough. There has to be a a specific concentration on developing passion and emotionalism in our connection to Hashem. So uh, he understood the problem, and this was the problem, and this is this is the issue of Rafu Yedeim in Torah. So that's Achilles' heel number one. If I could switch the metaphor. Achilles' heel number one that makes us vulnerable to Amalek is Rafidim, Rafu Yedeim in Torah. Now let's fast forward 40 years. We're approaching the end of the Chumash, right? The end of the Israelite wandering. They're about to go to Eretz Israel, And in that last year, first Miriam dies, and then Moshe, then Aaron dies. Then finally, at the very end of the Torah, Moshe dies. Today, by the way, it was the, uh, today was the seventh of Adar. Today was the birthday and the death day, the yard site, of Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, died the Zion of Adar. Now, Chazal tell us that there were three miracles in the desert that came in the merit of these three towering figures. The man came to us in the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu. The clouds of glory came to us in the merit of Aaron. And the traveling well of water that gave us water came in the merit of Miriam. So the Anani Hakava, the clouds of glory, come in the merit of Aaron. When Aaron died, the Anane HaKavod left because he was the reason they were there. We now become vulnerable to enemies. Amalek attacks us. Now what's the connection between Aaron and Anane HaKavod? So we know the following. Aaron represents a very beautiful and unique Midah. Pirkei Avos tells us we shall always try to be like the Talmidim, like the disciples of Aaron, to be a lover of peace, Ohev Shalom, a lover of peace, a pursuer of peace. Ohev Esabrios, one who loves all of God's creatures. That certainly includes non-Jews, may even include animals. Ohev Esabrios, it doesn't say Ohev Esayudim. Loves all of God's creatures. Umakarvan la Torah. And through the love that he has for others, he brings them to Torah. Do you see, I'm, 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 I'm kind of retranslating this. It, it's not two things. It's not that he loves people and he brings them to Torah. It's actually a cause and effect. Through the love that he has for them, they see the Torah as good and noble and they want to become part of it. That is how you educate. That is how you influence. That is how you bring people, including your own children, to Torah, by the love that you show them. Now why does that correlate to the clouds of glory? Because the clouds of glory also represent the intimacy and love that God is showing us. He is hugging us with his presence. So Mida Keneged Mida. Aaron represents love of his fellow man. Therefore, in the merit of Aaron, we get that love shown to us by God. So, based on this, we could perhaps say the following. 
If Achilles seal number one that makes us vulnerable to Amalek is the complacency and lack of passion in Avodat Hashem, Achilles seal number two is the sinas chinam, the hatred or the lack of love we have for each other. So when it says Aaron dies, it could refer metaphorically, not just to Aaron dying, but the Mida which he represented got diminished. We were vulnerable to Amalek because of the Sinat Chinam and polarization that existed within us. These are the two Sibot, these are the two separate reasons of Amalek within us that makes us vulnerable to the Amalek outside of us and they correspond to the two times Amalek attacked us in the desert. One is a complacency in the service of God in which even if you go through the motions you do so without passion and without excitement. And the second is the hatred and by say hatred by the way I don't mean it doesn't have to be hot hatred it doesn't have to mean uh, I throw stones at somebody hatred can also be indifference lack of interest in the other person the creation of cliques we have our group whoever our group is and then there's the other all of that is hatred so hatred does not necessarily mean uh, what you might call hot hatred but indifference is also a form of hatred. In fact, Ile Wazel uh, often, often remarked that the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. Hate and love can actually coexist. O often if you love somebody, you feel very, very strongly about them. So if they do something that hurts you, you, know, you, have, you may have feelings of hate. But when you're indifferent, they don't affect you one way or the other. So Sinat Chinam is labdafka hatred. It can refer to a coldness and an indifference. There's my people and there's everybody else. So these are the two Achilles heels in the Torah that makes us vulnerable to Amalek. And when we have to eradicate Amalek, we have to work on these two ideas. Now, here is the interesting point. Let's uh, flash forward again to the Purim story. Now again, just to give you a little little history to be sure you understand the chronology, uh, the Purim story, of course, is not in the Chumash, it's not in the Torah, but it is in the Bible, it's in the Tanakh. Uh, when did the story of Purim take place? Now I'm not going to give you a year-by-year -year breakdown, that's actually a little complicated, but basically, the uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, destroyed the Beis Hamikdash and sent the Jewish people into exile. Babylon was eventually conquered by the Persian Empire. And the story of Purim occurs towards the end of the 70 years of exile before the Jews returned to the land of Israel and were able to build the second temple. So at the time of the story of Purim, uh, we are still in the 70 years of exile that was started by Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, the Persian king, who actually finally authorized the building of the Beis Hamikdash, was none other than a king that was the son of Esther and Achashverosh, and his name is Daryavish, Darius II. So the Beis Hamikdash is built. I'm not sure if Esther was alive, I have to check the chronology, but after Achashverosh died, their son Darius became king and he was the one who actually completed the building of the second temple. So it's a little bit of an irony of history that the Persian king who built the second temple happened to be Jewish. Just like they say there's a Jewish pope uh, here and there, etc. Uh, well, of course, the first pope was, was definitionally Jewish. The first pope, first bishop of Rome was the apostle Peter. <laughs> Peter was, was certainly a Jew. So when people say, was there ever a Jewish pope? we at least know there was one for sure but some say over the years there were other Jewish popes who were keeping the mitzvot privately and secretly you know who knows now Darius we're not sure did Darius a lot of questions did Darius know he was Jewish did he think he was Jewish uh, did Darius put on tefillin uh, did he keep mitzvot 
We don't really know, but he was halachically Jewish because Esther was Jewish. Okay. So remember, therefore, that the book of Esther is an exile miracle. It happens in, in Golos. It happens without a Beis HaMikdash, although the Beis HaMikdash is going to be rebuilt soon. And it represents an extreme point of vulnerability in which all the Jews are concentrated. Now, they're not concentrated in one place. They're, they're spread over 127 provinces, but they're all under one king. It's kind of a dangerous situation. They're under one ruler who has absolute power, and the prime minister of this ruler is given license to hunt down and eradicate every single member of this nation. <coughs> Amalek, once again, it certainly was not the, in the king's interest to do so, but this is Amalek. So, if you think about it, the two Achilles heels, the two weaknesses that we had in the, in the uh, Midbar, the first time Amalek attacked us, and the second time, 40 years later, both of them made their appearance in the Purim story. Let me deal with the second one first because that's a little more obvious and this connects to what I mentioned last week. The second flaw, which is the iron flaw, is sinas chinam. Well, we very much know that there was sinas chinam even at that point because if you remember, I mentioned last week, when Haman is making his case to Achashverosh that the Jewish people should be destroyed, so Haman used the phrase, this is a group of people that is mefozar umeforad bein ha'amim. They are scattered and separated amongst the nations. Now remember that in Megillah Esther there is no mention of God's name. So whenever it says Melech, the Melech refers on one level to Achashverosh and on the other level to God. Higher level, lower level. Simple meaning, deeper meaning. So, same thing here. Haman says to the Melech, lower meaning, flesh and blood Haman, says to flesh and blood Melech. Higher meaning, the spiritual koach of Amalek argues with God that the Jewish people deserve to be destroyed. Now, if you understand lower meaning, higher meaning, then that continues with every part of the speech. Mefozar umeforad bein ha'amim. Scattered and separated among the nations. Lower meaning is, because the Jews are not concentrated in one place, it's easy to kill them because they don't have a critical mass to be able to fight back. That's what human Haman is saying to human Achashverosh. But what is the spiritual meaning? The Koach of Amalek is saying to the Almighty, the Jewish people don't deserve to survive because they are divided against each other. Hatred, polarization, indifference, cliquishness. Which means, in the statement, Mefozar umeforad bein ha'amim, you can identify the vulnerability that we face when there is sinat chinam. And that is why when Mordechai informs Esther, Hamalka, of this decree of Haman, Esther Hamalka's first words are, Lech Kenos es kol Now she declared a fast. But how did she declare the fast? Go and gather all the Jews together. So it's not just the fasting. It's if we're weak because mefozar meforad bein amim we get strength by coming together. So, in the Purim story, you can identify the same flaw that made us vulnerable after the death of Aaron. Now, where in the Purim story, though, this is going to be a little less obvious, do you identify a, genu a general weakening in passion and commitment to the Torah, the first flaw? So here, uh, it's a little less clear, but if, if you remember the beginning of Megillat Esther, it mentions Achashverosh made a huge party 
in which uh, he invited everybody to partake. And according to one of you in Chazal, the Jewish people deserve to be destroyed because they got pleasure from this party. In other words, the Jewish people came to the party, they ate and they drank, and they got pleasure from it, and because of that, they deserve to be destroyed. Now, let's think about what that teaching means. They got pleasure, meaning they ate, they what, they ate non-kosher food? Okay. But eating non-kosher food is not a capital crime. God does not destroy you because you ate non-kosher food. Right, so how could we say the Jewish nation deserved to be destroyed because they ate non-kosher food? So the Svas Emes says, the issue is not that they ate and drank. The issue is that they enjoyed it. Now why, why does that make it worse? Because let's go back to why Achashverosh made that party. Right? The Megillah doesn't give you any reason whatsoever. The Megillah just says, the third year of his reign, Achashverosh made a huge party. Why? So the Gemara in Megillah gives us a very complicated and interesting backstory. And that was, in fact, it's amazing how knowledgeable all of these ancient non-Jewish kings were about biblical prophecies. How why that uh, we Jews should be as knowledgeable about what's in the Tanakh as Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and Achashverosh, but they paid very close attention to biblical prophecies. Hashem told Yirmiyahu before the destruction of the first temple that there would be an exile for 70 years. Now there's a whole question, where do, where do you start counting the 70 years? Achashverosh counted the 70 years from a wrong point it turned out, but he counted it and it ended after the two years of his reign. Meaning to say when the third year of his reign began that was the conclusion of the 70 years. So according to his calculations the Jewish people should have been redeemed and yet they were not redeemed. He saw that as a sign that God has abandoned them. And as a result, you know what he did at the party? He took the utensils of the Beit HaMikdash that had been plundered by Nebuchadnezzar. And he used those utensils at his party. This was a party celebrating what he thought was God's abandonment of the Jewish people. What he thought was God making a statement that Galut is forever. It's not going to end. There's not going to be a rebuilding of the temple. There's not going to be a return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. That's what this party is about. And Jews came, and not only did they come, but they enjoyed it. Meaning, they were celebrating the same thing that Achashverus was celebrating. They were celebrating. Who needs Eretz Yisrael? Who needs the Beis HaMikdash? We're happy here. We have a life in Persia or the diaspora. So you see the Sfas HaSem is Chiddush. It doesn't say they were destroyed because they ate at the party. That wouldn't have been a reason to destroy them. They were destroyed because they got pleasure from what the party represented. Now, if you think about that, the idea that I can live in Galut all of my life, it makes no difference. I don't have to be an Eretz Israel. That is the epitome of lacking a passion for spirituality and growth because you're simply saying, I'm fine the way I am. I don't need anything more. So, the point I'm making is this, again, to summarize, because it's a bit of a, of a complicated uh, presentation, and that is, in the Midbar, Amalek attacked us twice. One when we left Mitzrayim, and the other 40 years later when Aaron died. In those two occasions, the weakness within us was the reason that made us vulnerable to Amalek, but it was a different weakness. The weakness the first time 
was a complacency and a lack of passion for connecting to God, which is called Rafidim. And the second time, the vulnerability was, we didn't have the attitude of our own to be Ohev Shalom, Rodev Shalom, we had Sinas Chinam. Right, that's in the Chumash. Purim, we actually had a double vulnerability. We had the attitude of Sinas Chinam, as we see in the phrase, Mephozar Umephorad Bein Ha'amim. And we had the complacency and lack of passion to connect to God, as is seen by the statement that we got pleasure from Achashverosh's party, which was a celebration of getting God out of our lives. It's almost saying, Baruch Hashem, God is not going to bother us. <laughs> Baruch Hashem, God is not going to bother us anymore with the base on Mikdash and the like. I think, so, I think Gorbachev once said like that, when, when the, before the Soviet Union disintegrated, and officially it was atheists, I think Gorbachev at one point said, thank God that you know, there's no God, or whatever, or something like that, but uh, one of those things. Even the atheist has to give thanks to the Almighty uh, for various things. Right? So, now you understand that Purim was a very dangerous time for us, meaning it was not a done deal that we would survive. Well, one has to be aware of this. We were vulnerable. In Shamayim, there was a lot of discussion. Should I let these people live? Or should I just wipe them out? It was not a Pasha thing. And that is why when the Jews were redeemed by the chesed of Hashem, by the love of Hashem, we understood that if God saved us from Amalek, we have to rectify the flaws within our personality that makes us vulnerable to Amalek. So now, let's see exactly how that happened. We know that in addition to reading the Megillah, uh, one of the unique mitzvahs of Purim, and this is in the Megillah itself, is Mishloach Manot Ishlo we send gifts of food, and we give money, or anything, you know, it could be food as well, we give gifts to the poor. By the way, the Rambam makes the point that Shalach uh, Manas, so you have to give at least two articles of food to one person. Okay, so if I gave, uh, no, some say it should be two different brachos, so if you gave one cookie and an apple to one person, you will have fulfilled your obligation of Mishloach Manos. That's all you have to do. Matanos li Evyonim, because of Evyonim is plural, you have to give to at least two poor people. So, so typically, most of us don't give directly to poor people, but if you give to a stock of funds, like Ibana, so they're going to distribute the money to more than one person. And even though it's not exactly the exact shekel, you know, the exact shekel you gave is going to go to one person, but whatever it's going to be, but, but uh, you're making them a shaliach, so everything they give will, will be credited. Uh, the Rambam writes that if a person wants to go beyond these minimums, beyond these minimums, it's a good thing, but it's better to focus more on gifts to the poor then Mishloach Manot. So this idea of um, you make a 200 Shaloch Manos full of chametz food and high calorie food and everything else, you know, is, you're not necessarily doing anybody a great, uh, great favor. One has to be cognizant of that. Pesach is only in a month. <laughs> so uh, w whatever it would be. But ultimately, what are these two unique mitzvot about? They're about love. They're about friendship. They're about making connections. Because, once again, if we're vulnerable to Amalek, because we are mefozar, meforad, bein ha'amim, then the only way we give thanks to Hashem for saving us from Amalek is when we recommit ourselves to achdus, unity, in Avat Yisrael, and that is exemplified in Mishloach Manot and Matanot Liyav Yonim. Because that is the antidote. That's the vaccine, right? Everyone's concerned about vaccines. That is the vaccine. And it doesn't cause autism. That is the vaccine for Amalek. Is 
That's correct. So it's brought down. It's brought down that mishloach manot should ideally be given to people with whom you don't necessarily have the best relationship. Now, now you have to be. You have to use your common sense here. Meaning, if you don't like somebody, but the person doesn't know that then by giving him shalach manas, you're signaling you don't like him. You know, so obviously you don't do that. But, but, but if the pshat is, you know, both of you know that your relationship is strained and you go out of your way to send a gift, so that's a gesture of reconciliation. That's a gesture of saying, I know that we've had our disagreements, but let's be friends. So you have to approach it in common sense. Don't, uh, uh, and that's even the reason for the minah that lechatchila mishloach manot should be given through a shaliach. By a shaliach, I mean to say that if I want to give you shaliach manot, instead of my, me giving it to you directly, I appoint a third party. Usually, usually a kid who gets a tip or whatever it would be, but it could be an adult too. Why, why do you do it through a shaliach? Because you want to get more people involved in friendship and community. So that is what we do on Purim to counteract the mefozar, meforad, bein ha'amim. Now, how do we counteract the rafu yedehem in Atora, the complacency and lack of passion? So this is a little less obvious, but I think I mentioned last week, and I'll mention it again, that Purim is also a day of re-accepting Hashem's Torah. According to Chazal, when we accepted the Torah at Har Sinai, Hashem held the mountain over our heads and said, accept the Torah or else. So we accepted it with a certain measure of duress, compulsion, and fear at Sinai. On Purim, Chazal say, we accepted out of love what we had previously accepted out of fear. This is the meaning of the phrase, kiamu v'kiblu. They validated what they had accepted. So Chazal's interpretation is that at Sinai it was fear and this is love. Now there are many, many differences between serving God out of fear and serving God out of love. But one of the differences is the amount of passion and excitement that you bring to your Avaida. When I do something because I know I'm going to get hurt, punished, if I don't do it, so I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to do it with joy and enthusiasm. When I accept out of love, love of God, then everything becomes a joy. So, in a sense, therefore, the tikkun for the refidim, refidim is rough for you, their hands are weak, is Kabbalah Satora Biava. So, the point is, in the Midbar, we were attacked twice. We had two flaws, two vulnerabilities to Amalek. Purim, we had both vulnerabilities at the same time. And in our celebration of Purim, we attempt to rectify those two vulnerabilities in the various aspects of Purim, both in terms of unity, togetherness, Avat Yisrael, and in terms of reaccepting Hashem's Torah with love. Unfortunately, sometimes that second aspect gets overlooked in Purim because people uh, are so involved in uh, the other part of it, which is, again, that's the mitzvah too. But uh, one, one should know that uh, some people have a minag, and in fact, in Yushalayim, quite a few people have such a minag, in which, although Purim is a day, of course, in Yushalayim, Purim is a, the, the day after, what's called Shushan Purim, and the rest of the world is, is our Purim here. So I think Israelis love, uh, all Israelis, uh, secular, religious, Haredi, Dati, Lumi, all Israelis love parties. So essentially, uh, even though technically Yerushalayim and Purim is only Tuesday night and uh, Wednesday, but essentially everybody has two days of Purim. Uh, you know, uh, they figure out one way or the other. Either they go to B'nai Brak and come back, or even in Yerushalayim they essentially, they don't read Megillah here on the... Uh, on the uh, 14th of Adar. They're not going to read Megillah on, Mon on Tuesday, but uh, they'll have, they'll have uh, parties and, and other, things, other things like that. Uh, but before the partying begins, there are people who get up 4 o'clock in the morning, and they go to Shul, 
And there are minyanim that daven with great, great kavana and devotion. And then they follow it with learning for at least uh, an hour, two hours, etc. To understand that Purim is also a day of Kabbalah Satora. And let me just add another aspect of Purim that people sometimes forget. It is a day where the power of prayer is very, very great. And the mushal they give is this. The whole year, when a poor person asks me for tzedakah, I'm allowed to uh, ask him for credentials, meaning, uh, how do I know, you know, maybe you're lying to me, meaning, do you have a letter from a rabbi, do you have uh, some proof that you need the money, etc. And unless the person asks for food, if the person asks for food, you have to give him food, because God forbid, if somebody's on the verge of starvation, you don't give him food, he, you know, theoretically he may drop dead. So if he really wants food, you know that you give him, if you have, if you have. Uh, but if he wants money, uh, usually you, you could say, I need some proof. Usually. But on Purim, the rule is, anybody that asks you, you have to give something. You don't investigate credentials on Purim. Now that doesn't mean you have to give them a hundred dollars, but you have to give something. So, they say, Hashem on Purim is the same way. The whole year when we pray to God, God may examine our credentials. Are you worthy? Are you not worthy? Uh, let's see your merits. Let's see your mitzvahs. But on Purim, call up poshet yad. Anybody who stretches forth his hand for the mercy of God, knows them low. God gives to him. So one has to remember that Purim is also a day of prayer. Hashem listened to our prayers in the days of Mordechai and Esther, of course. And Hashem listens to our prayers now. It's so amazing that some things don't change. Uh, Iran is Persia, right? So Purim, uh, almost 2,000 years ago, actually two, you know, more, more than two, a little more than 2,000 years ago, there was this great Persian empire, very powerful empire, that wanted to destroy us. And today, 5780, second of the year 2020, there's this great, <coughs> powerful nuclear power, Iran, Persia, that also wants to destroy us. So what's the French saying? I, I can't pronounce it in French, but the, the more things change, the more they remain the same. A lot of things don't, don't change too much. And the Amaleks of the world are still here in various forms and ideologies, even if they're not physically descended, descended from Amalek. And therefore, the same way that our vulnerability to the outside Amaleks depends on the weaknesses within us, we got to correct it. In the same way that Purim was a time of prayer where Hashem heard our prayers and gave us a ge'ula, that's equally true now as well. So with all of the joy of Purim, we should realize how holy it is, how special it is, and how it will enable us to achieve a real, real ge'ula. And may we be zocha b'mehra of Yemena to that, uh, to that redemption. And may we experience the same redemption uh, as the Jewish people experienced then, and may it be the precursor for the Bias uh, Mashiach. Happy Purim.